Welcome to Jewish Cinematheque, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today we meet filmmaker Jeremy Neuberger, who together with Seth Kramer and Daniel A. Miller created the documentary Heading Home, the tale of Team Israel. The three filmmakers who met in their youth in the Young Judea Youth Movement uh, created Ironbound Films, producers of documentaries for theaters, television, and the web. Jeremy, welcome to Jewish Cinema Tech. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have to tell you, I watched this film and I'm sitting there going, come on, win that game, get that pitch in. It was, it's wonderful. How did this whole concept begin, evolve, and how did you make it happen? Well, much like everything starts, it started at Jewish sleepaway camp. Uh, my old friend Jonathan Mayo and my current filmmaking partner Daniel Miller, the three of us went to Camp Sprout Lake somewhere near Poughkeepsie, New York, back in the early to mid 80s. Great camp, great camp. Terrific camp. I have uh, to admit I'm a young Judean, so um, I'm pushing for it. Jonathan Mayo was probably the only kid who could play baseball at the camp, because as you remember, Jewish camp is not exactly a sports thing, but he could play really well. And uh, as the years went by, he became a a writer for Major League Baseball and a reporter for the uh, prospects of Major League Baseball. And Dan and I, we became filmmakers with you know about six or seven films under our belt. And Jonathan kept coming to us saying, let's make a movie together. And we tried and tried. And some of our you know, ideas went nowhere. And then Jonathan had a great idea, which was, let's talk to all the Jews in baseball. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So we went to spring training in Florida and Arizona, and we interviewed all the Jews that we could find. How did you identify who, who was Jewish and who was not? <laughs> well, Jonathan had made it his sort of, uh, I want to say, obsession of who's Jewish in baseball. And because he interviewed people, uh, prospects, as they were starting, he would always find the Jews and sort of shelve them up here. And when we made our plans to film, he arranged all of the Jews to, you know, come from their minor league or major league stadiums for an interview. So we went out and we interviewed uh, Brad Ausmus, who was the manager at the time of the Tigers, and uh, Josh Zide, who was on the Tigers, Ike, uh, Ike Davis, Ian Kinsler, Jock Peterson. Just for our audience who may not know, so we're talking about the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, yeah Detroit Tigers. And the, uh, Ike the was on the A's at the time. The A's from... Oakland. Oakland right. There were actually three Jews on the A's and three Jews on the Tigers. So oh those my. were two great stops when we were shooting. Saved us money. We could get more than <laughs> one Jew at the stadium. Uh, and all of them were asked questions about what it meant to be a Jew in baseball, how they got started, have you been to Israel. And Jonathan's plan was, well, let's take them on a birthright trip to Israel. You know, we'll bring them all together and we'll go. So we figured this is the movie. So we started interviewing them. And we come home with this great footage, and lo and behold, no one wants to pay for the trip. So of course not. We shelved it. <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy named Peter Kurz, who's the general manager of Team Israel, he developed the team. Wait, wait, let me just stop you here for yeah, a second. Yeah, sure. The general manager of Team So there already was a Team Israel. There was. That had competed over the years in this yeah, well, I should say that there's something called the World Baseball Classic. Okay. And it's kind of like the Olympics or the World Cup of baseball because it's every four years. It's a com competition between different teams from other countries. And they pull from major and minor league systems to stock the deck or stack the deck uh, of these different teams. Every four years, Major League Baseball puts on the World Baseball Classic basically the baseball equivalent to the World Cup. Joining me right now to talk about it is MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred. It gives us a chance to give fans around the world an opportunity to see the best players in the world. Only 16 teams get to qualify. I have Puerto Rico beating the reigning champions, the Dominican Republic. The U.S. is going to win. Oh. When I found out that Israel was going to have a team, I, did, I thought it was a pipe dream. I never thought it was going to happen. I think my, my agent contacted me and he said, hey, I got a call. Israel's playing in the qualifier for the WBC. Would you be interested? I'm very proud to be Jewish. 
There's no better stage, no better team. It's my favorite game in the world. Why not play? The Israeli team had a bunch of American Jews uh, on the team because in order to qualify, you just had to have a Jewish grandparent. So there was a, a heritage rule that said, if your grandma was Jewish, you're in. And it's, it's the same uh, rules that allow you to become a citizen of the country. Uh, so Peter put together a team you know, in 2012 at the last one, but they didn't do so well, and then put together this new team uh, in 2016 that happened to be guys that me and Jonathan had interviewed. Wow. And lo and behold, they qualified for the final you know, 16 to 18 teams of the World Baseball Classic. How did that qualification? I think you include that in the film. It's in the film. It took place in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn. right. And it was, uh, it was an incredible moment in Jewish sports history because Israel had never qualified in baseball before. And all of a sudden, they were going to be one of the top teams in baseball. So it was very exciting. And then all of a sudden, I got, you know, my phone was ringing off the hook. You know, hey, the team qualified. They want to go to Israel on a trip. Uh, do you want to come along? And, and it all happened really quickly after that. So there are different groups that bring actors to Israel, who bring journalists to Israel, you know, people from different professions. Was this a, a, the first time that Jewish baseball players had ever been brought to Israel on a trip I, together? I a think it was the biggest assemble of, you know, major league baseball stars. I know that Israel tried to have a baseball league a few years earlier, and a few journeymen from the minor league systems kind of went over there to try and get something started, but it, it didn't stick. It didn't take. So this was really the first time that, you know, a major leaguer like Ike Davis was, you know, coming over, and it, it was wild. What, what caught me in the film and it, you really did a great job capturing this, the whole issue of what it was for these players, in some cases, to rediscover their Jewishness. Just yeah. being in Israel, connecting with something that maybe, you know, so a few of them had had bar mitzvahs, others were tangentially Jewish. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I, I mean, I you can. were there. I mean, I've lived in Israel for some time. I have family in Israel, but I'm really a diaspora Jew. I'm an American Jew. I've lived in America my whole life. Same with my fellow filmmakers. So there's a part of the diaspora Jewish experience that's embedded into this film because the majority of the team that represented Israel were, I'd say, everyone but two guys were Americans. Two guys uh, were Israelis? Yeah, there were two Israelis, but both of them live here. So because the, the, uh, the, the makeup of the team was sort of resembled our Israel experience or connection to Israel, it was a personal project for us to kind of define what does it mean to love Israel when you don't live there? And what does it mean to represent Israel? And what's your uh, connection to Judaism? And why is Israel sort of the vehicle for that? And those were some of the themes we were exploring as we followed Team Israel on a trip to visit the country that they were going to play for on the world stage, which is really something if you think about it. All of a sudden, you're representing Israel uh, in Korea. And what does that mean? What is, you know, so is there, I had friends who, you know, played some softball in Israel and, and, and you know, every once in a while I would go out and set up a game. But are there baseball fields in Israel? Um, uh, is there an actual league that's, that's taking place? And at some point, do you envision that the players on Team Israel will be largely Israelis? Yeah. So Israel had one baseball field when we made this film. Uh, and, Where? Uh, I think it's in uh, Peta Tikva. It's called the Baptist Field. It's, wow. it's run by Baptists, mm -hmm. the, the village that it's in. And Peter Kurz, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he would assemble youth teams that would compete in the European competitions. So, like, there'd be a team of, you know, 11th grader uh, Israelis, uh, and those teams are largely made up of Israelis. As a matter of fact, Israel was ranked like 200 in the World Baseball Classic because it was based on the performance of their Israeli teams up to that point. Uh, but to answer your question, since the filming of this movie, I think there's now one completed fil field, two fields in production, uh, and the plan is to build more and more. It takes a little bit to turn a sport uh, into something in a country that doesn't play that sport. Uh, a large contingent of the interest in Israel for baseball is from expats who have moved from New York to Israel who, you know, watch Mets games at 2 in the morning or are, you know, diehard Yankee fans. Uh, that is what was driving the early stages of baseball in Israel. Uh, it's from the, the guys who made Aliyah from, from America. Wow.
In terms of starting pitching, I mean, you know, obviously Marquis is going to be the starter. Jason Marquis had retired. The first time I called him, he was in Disneyland with his kids. They went on a ride, uh, and I was sitting on a bench, and I discussed it with my wife and what she thought, so I committed to playing. He said, you know what, I'm, I'm looking to make a comeback, and maybe this could be the comeback. We've got Zide, we've got Baker, we've got Bleich. Is he there? Where'd I put him? The great challenge was finding the guys without the Jewish names. Ty Kelly with his first major league home run! My dad's side of the family is Irish and Catholic, and my mom's side of the family is Polish and Jewish. By chance, a guy called me up. My kid had a yarmulke on him, and Ty Kelly came over, signed some autographs, and said he was Jewish. What is your excitement level about getting over to South Korea and, and getting going in that tournament? Uh, I'm very excited. Should I look at you or should I look up there at the Either camera? one. Either one. Me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Um, I got an email from Peter Kurtz. You know, as long as the Mets were okay with it, I, I was going to go. Asking if I had a Jewish grandparent, and the rest is history. So take us on the journey. So, you know, you've, you've, you go with them to Israel. The ball players are there. It's great, you see them walking through the streets of Israel, you see kids coming in and asking for autographs and having selfies, it's, it's special. They go back to the United States and then what happened? So after their trip to Israel, uh, the team had a little downtime before they had to meet back in Arizona for mini camp. Uh, they were heading to Korea for roughly two weeks ahead of the World Baseball Classic to both practice, they had some scrimmages against other teams, uh, so this is happening right before spring training. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why there's not, you know, a flood of major league names in World Baseball Classic is because a lot of guys don't give their time during spring training. And if you give up your time in spring training, you could lose your place on a team. You could lose your place. You could get injured. As a matter of fact, the Netherlands had D.D. Gregorius, who if you're a Yankees fan, he's uh, a Yankee who got injured at the end of this World Baseball Classic and missed the first part of the Yankee season. Oh, I can so imagine that's that. That's a tale of woe, right? Wow. So after a little downtime where the players were sort of getting ready, the filmmakers were raising money in order to pay for the trip to Korea, uh, we then met in Arizona for what was like about a week of mini camp where the whole team assembled and then flew from Arizona to Seoul, Korea, where I think I was gone for about a month following these guys around uh, with no plans of a return ticket because we had to see how they did. Right. Uh, and Korea was, you know, fantastic. The players loved visiting Korea. The core group of guys that had gone to Israel, though, I think that that trip was uh, sort of monumental in terms of the team building of Team Israel. Uh, the dynamics between, let's say, the pitcher, Josh Zide, and the catcher, Ryan LaVarnway, whose friendship was sort of, uh, you know, a bromance experienced in Israel, was really incredibly important to the success that the team has in the series. And uh, they refer back to it. A lot of them sort of acknowledge that. So, so it was great to be a fly in the wall in Israel. I can only uh, imagine. But it, then, it was the three of you, right? All three of you? Well, are... uh, my partner, Dan Miller, was uh, back uh, sort of managing, pulling the strings. You know, it's not easy to kind of show up at a, uh, in Korea, get permission from Major League Baseball, uh, you know, get yourself into these different places with gear. So it's helpful to have someone who's kind of in the control room, so to speak. And that was back in New York. But Seth and I were in the field, um, a fly in the wall, following these guys. When we were in Israel, we sort of bonded with the players, uh, and it was almost like we were part of the team. Uh, when you get to Korea, they're a little bit more focused on business, so a lot of chasing, a lot of bribing them to come out to dinner in order to, you know, interview them, that kind of thing that production people know about. Gotcha. Uh, what happened then? What happened uh, at the classic? So they go to Korea, and all of a sudden, they defy the odds. They become the Cinderella story of the World Baseball Classic. Uh, I mean, if I was a betting man, uh, you know, and knew this, I, I could have, you know, put a lot of money on them, but I didn't. But all of a sudden, people were texting us. They were in the front page you know, of newspapers in Israel. The New York Times did a huge story on them. The world sort of exploded with interest in this team of Jews who were winning at the World Baseball Classic. And it's going to be Josh Zide out for his third inning of work. I got my very first Jewish star when I was eight years old. 
I'll be throwing a pitch and it'll just come up and hit me in the face. And that, may, that reminds me that God's there. Zide's got to get one more out. Strike one. Teams will say you can't wear necklaces. Oh, and two. Team Korea down to their last strike. I wear it regardless. Day Ho Lee strikes out, and Team Israel wins it two to one in 10 innings. And how about that? Tomorrow, Israel against Chinese Taipei at noon local time. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, you include this in the film, includes a tweet with some footage. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, uh, Netanyahu was very excited about uh, the singing of the national anthem where the players come out and they remove their baseball hats, you know, to sing the anthem and they're wearing yarmulkes. And that's, you know, that's the, the picture we have behind you. It was a powerful moment. Yeah. Taking off their hats because you have to do it for the national anthem and then putting on the kippah with hatikva. It's hard to keep a, a dry eye when you see that happen if you have the, uh, the same kind of love for Israel that a lot of us Jews have uh, because it means so much. And to see uh, Jews on the, the world stage as athletes, I think it even means a little bit more. It, it's not what you imagine. It's not what the world thinks of when they think of Jewish people. I, they, I, yeah. they think of us more as accountants and you know lawyers, and but seeing athletes, uh, you know, standing there with yarmulkes, it's really something special. So they go ahead, they win the first game. They then uh, they they pretty much clean up in Korea uh, and advance to the next group of teams in Japan, and that is that defies all expectations. Uh, that automatically qualified them for the next World Bo Baseball Classic in 2021 to boot. Uh, just by being in the top eight teams in baseball. I mean, it, that, r that right there was amazing. We got into sort of a Dayenu situation right. where we didn't know, would it have been enough if they had just won that first game in Korea? You know, would it be enough if they swept that group? And then we're in Japan, and they, they face Cuba, which is an incredible baseball team, and they beat Cuba. So it just kept going. I, I didn't quite know where or how it was going to end. You included in the film, uh, which, which I give you credit for, there's a moment where I, I believe it's uh, one of the reporters from Cuba uh, asks, you know, what is this? Uh, we thought we were playing Team Israel. We feel like we're playing Team America, too. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose to include that? I mean, you're a documentarian. Yeah. You, you make choices. You include things. You don't include things. Yeah, well, all of a sudden we had a villain show up in the film, and that was this reporter who was pretty much dismissing uh, Israel's team as being like the JV team of America. But if you pay attention to the rules of World Baseball Classic, the teams are made up of people who are not necessarily born or raised in these countries that they're playing for, but are qualified as, you know, uh, could be citizens. Uh, that's why someone like Didi Gregor, who I mentioned from the Yankees, was on Team Netherlands. He's not from the Netherlands, he's from an island somewhere, you know, Curacao or something. So it's the rules. Uh, the Cuban team was sour grapes, uh, this reporter was, because, I mean, think it from their perspective, to lose to Israel when you're Cuba, I mean, that's got to be the worst thing that ever happened to Cuban baseball. Cuba's used so, to even beating the United States. Yeah, I mean, Cuba's really good, and it's important. So I think that was a little bit of a saving face moment, and, uh, and it had to be included. It was too rich. And Jerry Weinstein, who's the manager of Team Israel, his response is, like, you know, perfect. He's just, you know, it's like a, a typical Brooklyn Jewish response to it. Like, yeah, we beat you, brother, you know. And it, you're going to have to watch the movie to see, uh, to see his response. Yeah. Then, then they go on to Tokyo. Yes. Well, Cuba, they play in Tokyo. Tokyo was the next group of teams, and they have a little rivalry with the Netherlands. I won't spoil what happens, but uh, it is their fate is decided in Japan, but not before uh, advancing so far in this tournament that they've made a name for Israel in the baseball map, which I think surprised Israelis as well. Israel is not a baseball country. I mean, I show this film to my relatives and my family in Israel, and, you know, it, before they see it, it's always sort of a puzzling, like, head-scratching, like, so they're, look, they're, they're we, don't, uh, we don't <laughs> necessarily, we don't like baseball, but, uh, but then after the movie, they get it. It's like the soul of the country and the connection to diaspora Jews, they get it. 
So it just takes it. a little arm twisting. You put your finger on it. It's the connection of the diaspora Jew to Israel, to be a di diaspora Jew representing the state of Israel. That's fantastic. <laughs> I hope one day they'll have, you know, a Palestinian team from the throwing stones. For those of you who don't know, there was a terror attack. Oh my god. Yeah. Why you come here to Israel and not stay in America? You guys are going to be Israeli warriors. We were 200 to 1 favorites to win the World Baseball Classic. For Team Israel, it's a chance for the underdog to get a crack at the big dog. It's not about my career. You guys aren't unknown anymore. It's not about any of our careers. And you thought all our people could do was finance. It's about something bigger. Can you please explain what the mensch to your right is? That's Jerry Weinstein, my manager. Oh, well, this. I mean, I've spent the last year and a half going around the country with the film, and it's an apolitical film. You don't have to be on the left or the right. You just have to be a Jew, and you understand the connection to Israel, and you get it. And people love it for that reason. It's a uniting film. It reminds you of what your love for Israel has been based on, why you connected to that country. Because you see it through these guys who, let's be honest, these guys didn't grow up bar mitzvah, as you mentioned earlier. Many of them didn't go to Hebrew school. A lot of them maybe even are just by marriage Jewish. Uh, but all of a sudden, they're representing Israel on the world stage. And that puts a lot on them. So for them to connect to what their Judaism is and for you to watch the transformation of that connection, it's something special. It's great. So here they are in, uh, in Tokyo, and I believe there was an, an injury to one of the pitchers. Uh, an injury? Uh, I don't recall injury, but the, you know, the, the, the pressure is on for the pitchers uh, against these really good teams. We're now playing against the top teams in baseball. Which, which were? I mean, uh, Cuba and the Netherlands uh, and Japan have dynamite players. I mean, you see a lot of Japanese players now in Major League Baseball. That's because they are... Uh, baseball fanatics in Japan. They have a whole uh, minor league and major league there that has talent that's coming to our major league. Right. They take baseball very seriously. And when Israel arrived in Japan, the team was treated like you know hero heroes or ambassadors of the sport. So they were very welcome. No anti-Semitism. Uh, it wasn't a Munich environment. Right. It was we're here because we all love baseball and we're you know respecting the fact that you're here. And they didn't mind that they had this giant stuffed rabbi mensch mascot because they like mascots in Japan. Talk about your mascot. The mascot came about from one of the players, Cody Decker, who uh, saw him on Shark Tank. And all of a sudden, this uh, stuffed rabbi toy, they got a giant one, and he sat in the dugout for all the games and was getting more press uh, leads than any player on the team. He became the star, especially in Japan and, and Korea, where mascots sort of reign supreme. It was, it was hilarious to hear uh, reporters in Japan asking about the mensch. Uh, you know, a, a Yiddish term that you don't really associate with the Japanese. Wow. Uh, I don't want to give away what happens in Japan. Um, just tell us a little bit about some of the players. Uh, well, Ryan LaVarnway, who's the catcher from Team Israel, he just spent the last year playing in the minor league Yankees team and got bumped up to the majors by the Reds just like a week or two ago. And what was fascinating was he hit two home runs and got more RBIs than any Reds player debut in 150 years. So this was like the first, uh, since the wrap of the World Baseball Classic, a really like moving, awesome moment for Team Israel. One of their stars you know, got into the majors. But a lot of them have retired. Ike Davis, who the New York audiences will remember, was a slugger for the Mets. Right. He's retired, living out in Arizona, finally enjoying his downtime. Uh, Ty Kelly was another New York Met. Uh, he's still slugging it out. A lot of these guys are still trying to make it to the majors. And those who are not are working in front office jobs, like Sam Fold. He's working uh, in the, uh, I think it's Pittsburgh, sorry, in Philly, uh, in the front office. 
you know, they're connected to baseball for life. It's great. And, and they're going to prepare for the, uh, the Olympics now. So, so I understand that you've got some plans on, on doing some things with, with film and the Olympics. Can yeah, so we've got a that? sequel in the works. If you like this film, you'll love Heading Home 2, Return of the Mensch. <laughs> it's following Team Israel's efforts to qualify and get gold medal in the Olympics. And right now, Team Israel has played, I'd say, about six or seven games and swept all the teams, like already. Team Israel, and again, it's American Jews. Uh, there's a few more Israelis on the team. Peter's the general manager of the Olympic team, and I believe that uh, in September they have to qualify uh, and beat the top five teams in you know international baseball, and they make it to the Olympics in 2020 in Tokyo. But the Olympics are during the summer, right in the middle of baseball, baseball season. So these are not big names you've heard of. Some of the guys from the Team Israel team are on the team. Other guys are independent ball players, minor leaguers, journeymen, uh, some retired guys coming back in. Uh, but it's it's a team that look out. Uh, these guys, I think, they might win Israel its second you know gold medal. There's only one gold medal ever won in Israel. Do you know what sport that was for? I think, if I remember correctly, it was something to do with sailing. Yeah, windsurfing. Windsurfing, so, right? <laughs> I only know this because on the cover of our arts, there was a story about the the gold medal, and the guy was broke and was selling it. And I was like, oh, my God, you want to think about how Israel cares about some of their you know, other sports that sort of summarizes it. So I'm hopeful they'll, they'll make it to the Olympics. I think it would be a fun follow up. And we've had so much fun making and showing this film that it'd be great to do it again. So that's what my interest is just well, to keep I, it going. It's so I, much fun. I wish you well. It's, it's tough to raise money to make a film like this. And uh, I imagine it's going to be difficult. And you did it. Yeah. It's going to be difficult uh, with the next film. Yeah, it'll be difficult. It's getting a little easier. Uh, you know, we're, we've been rolling through uh, cities and theaters. We're coming to New York very, very soon. People will be able to see the, the film in theaters and all over New York and L.A. Uh, and because the film is getting out there, it's becoming a little easier. I don't want to, you know, knock on wood over here, but people really connected with the film and the story and the team. So finding interest to kind of be a producer or a funder of the next one, not as hard. I wish you lots of luck. Jeremy, what a pleasure it, uh, it's been for me to, to have you join us and much success with the, um, with the release of, uh, of Heading Home. Thanks. The Tale of Team Israel. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.